Our next panel is hosted by our partner, Hill, Hill & Knowlton Strategies. Solutions for civility, how business can restore discourse and lead progress. That is a big topic and we'll be digging into it a bit more later this afternoon too. But to kick us off, welcome to the stage Bob Feldman, founder of the Dialogue Project, Duke University, and Grant Toops, Global Chief Technolo Technology Officer, Hill & Knowlton Strategies, who will be leading the conversation as moderators. Please welcome Bob and Grant to the stage. How's everybody doing today? That's okay. We can do better, I think. How's everybody doing today? All right, very good. Um, so I'm Grant Toops, and uh, I am, as Steve said, the Global Chief Technology Officer at Hill & Knowlton Strategies, and I am really excited to get to spend a little bit of time with you today. As uh, some of you may have noticed, I was not originally on the agenda. I'm pinch hitting for someone. Um, so I have the great honor of spending some time with a longtime friend and colleague and mentor of mine um, who recently, um, after a distinguished career as a chief marketing communications officer, a big agency CEO, an entrepreneur, an investor, founded something called the Dialogue Project, which now is housed at Duke. So tell us a little bit about what the Dialogue Project is and why you sought to create it. OK, thank you. I first want to say I'm kind of depressed looking at this picture behind me with two of us seriously in need of more hair. Nah. It's, uh, Anybody yeah. who works at a pharma company, work on that. Like yeah. we, the injections, it would be great. In any case. Thank you. It's it, it actually it's great to be here. I was just saying to Steve Barrett, you know, major kudos for putting together a a great agenda and b for, you know, so many people kind of coming out in person. It's so great to be back in these kind of in person experiences. I mean, you know, Zoom is pretty good, but it's not the same thing. So congratulations on a great conference. And it's really fun to be with Grant. Grant and I, you know, we started working together in 2007. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's like 15 years. Uh, so, as he said, I've been friends and colleagues for a long time. So, uh, a few years ago, I actually had to give a speech at the Page Society. I got some awards, and had to give a speech, and so when you give a speech, you have to think about what are you going to talk about. And uh, usually people would pontificate on the state of the communications industry, and I figured nobody, somebody really needs to get that phone, don't they? It's like, <laughs> but, but one way to do it, it's just very, take very it out very. of it. Uh, it, so, you know, I wanted to think of something that might be interesting to the crowd. So I wound up focusing on what, what business might be able to do about the polarization we have in our society. And in the course of writing it, kind of realized I didn't really know all that much and that it needed some research. So frankly, what I primarily did at the speech was say, I'm going to do some research. And I kind of roped in some colleagues of mine, some of you guys may be with companies who contributed to this to kind of fund research and so forth. Companies like Southwest Airlines, Allstate, General Motors, uh, a bunch of other companies contributed. And so we did this research, and then a year later announced uh, what business could do. And we got a lot of great participation from people like Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan Chase, Doug McMillan uh, at Walmart, Mary Barra at General Motors, and a bunch of people. It was really good. And honestly, it was just going to be a speech, and then it became kind of this piece of research. And then I thought, this issue is not getting any better, you know, polarization and civil discourse in our society, and that it probably should live on. And so I thought uh, an academic setting would be the, the best kind of infrastructure for it, where it could get resourced and have energy and some intellectual rigor, yada, yada, yada. So I spoke to a number of schools, and, you know, long story short, the business school at Duke, uh, Fuqua, the Fuqua School of Business at Duke University, uh, really, really was enthusiastic about kind of housing this program. So it's now in residence at Duke. I'm very, I'll be down there on Monday. Uh, and we're doing a lot of programming to try to stimulate business to do more about helping. Not, they're not going to solve it, but to help uh, solve this problem. Well, I, so let's, let's dig in on this problem, right? I think it, it, it bears perhaps taking a second as a person who spends basically all of my time these days focused on technology and the communications and marketing space, a lot of the challenges we're dealing with are, are caused in part by technology, by the fact that through a global pandemic and any number of, of, of other things, we live in an increasingly polarized world where increasingly, certainly online, we're surrounded by people who share similar beliefs, 
similar points of view. We, we live um, often in an echo chamber unless we actively try to escape that echo chamber. And one of the few places where that's not true is at work. So if you think about, you know, as, as the Dialogue Project research unfolded, was there anything that surprised you in the findings about the role that work plays or being at work um, around colleagues who perhaps don't share the views you might? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Uh, I think, for the most part, most of us don't really think about this all that much. Uh, I think whether it's at work or outside of work, we just, you know, I mean, for the most part, I think people kind of say, gee, it kind of sucks that the world's so polarized, and somehow that's other people's problem, or, or, or it's, it, if not it's other it's my problem too, maybe, but it's caused by other people, and there's not much I can do about it. And, uh, you know, as somebody once said, I've seen the enemy and it's us. I mean, the truth is, we're all kind of participants in this thing because to one extent or another, most of us, not all of us, but most of us, to your point, tend to live in bubbles. You know, we tend to be surrounded by people who think kind of like we do, whether it's family, friends, or whatever. And that's, I don't know, maybe that's just is what it is, but it doesn't mean that there's not something we can do about it, right? So the irony, you know, you, you know, Edelman does their trust barometer every year, and the, the one, this, this uh, the most recent one, referenced that uh, business is now the most trusted institution in this country, at least, uh, ahead of the government, ahead of media, ahead of even NGOs. So, you know, what does that mean? It, to me, it means there's both an opportunity as well as a responsibility for business to kind of step up and do something about this issue. To the point you just made, again, I don't think we really think about this, but work, particularly if you work in a relatively large company. Work is one of the very few places, if not the only place, where you're kind of on a regular basis exposed to people from different backgrounds and so forth. They, and you don't even know what, they, what, what their backgrounds are, but, you, but they come whether it's you know, a whole host of diversity that happens in the workplace. And if you think about it, a, a lot of uh, what business does is pull together diverse opinions on a whole range of issues, try to find some sort of solution that's productive, kind of moderate behavior, if you will, and find pathways forward. And that's what business to have to do that or you're, you're out of business, right? We need to kind of take that same thinking and apply it outside the workplace as well as inside the workplace. So if you think of the training right now, for example, that happens and all the DE&I training that goes on, you know, some of the core training that happens is around helping people learn how to better listen, respect diverse points of view, incorporate those points of view, and find pathways forward that make for kind of a better productive either business environment or just kind of a social environment. Right? But that kind of training happens, it's now happening, you know, a lot, a lot of places. There are, I don't know, 125 million uh, citizens of this country who are also employees, right? So a big percentage of them are going through all this training. But the presumption is all of this training is somehow relevant only like Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. And somehow that training is largely ignored on weekends. Mm -hmm. It's kind of crazy. We need to kind of find ways to, to do this. The, the last thing I would just say on this one point is that there are two big challenges. One is doing what I'm talking about. But the second, and maybe it actually becomes the first, is we need to find ways to engage with people who are not in our tribe. And my experience is that's actually hard. People may intellectually say, yes, I'd love to sit down and have a productive conversation and learn why somebody thinks this about, you know, pick an issue. They'd be, and, and I think most people would be interested in that. Whether or not they're capable of having it where it doesn't get too emotional is another issue, but I think most people are interested. I think a big problem that most of us have is finding people with whom you can have that kind of conversation. And we need to kind of figure out ways uh, through our various affiliations to be able to have those kinds of conversations. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you, you, you talked about the number of extremely high-profile CEOs running massive companies who, who got engaged in the project, right? And I think that says something about their perception of the importance of the topic in general. Mm -hmm. 
and how that then manifests on the ground in things like DEI training, in things like um, uh, conflict resolution training, and, and some of that kind of stuff that I think we're starting to see just increase more and more at levels throughout the organization. Are there other things that, in, in your interviews, in your, in your travels, and meeting with companies, that you're seeing sort of activate on the ground with respect to employees, and how to, to teach or provide yeah. safe spaces or practice spaces for this? I'll give you one great example. Is anybody here from General Mills? General Mills has a great program called Courageous Conversations. Uh, it started a number of years ago, uh, purely voluntary and pretty small. Long, long like pre-COVID, uh, they started this program where they would lean into the really, really difficult issues. So the kinds of issues, like race relations, immigration, LGBTQ issues, gun violence, I mean, name, you know, kind of a, a, a difficult issue. It's typically the issue that most CEOs and companies want to stay the hell away from. You know, it's like third rail, I don't want to talk about it, else I have to talk about it. These guys leaned into it. And what they did was they would bring, bring in an expert or two on the subject for about a half an hour, and then for an hour, engage in facilitated roundtable discussions among their employees on the issue, and really tough issues. And as various things happened over the course of the last five years that kind of made, that, made these issues even more uh, fraught with you know, risk for a company to facilitate these stuff, they leaned in, leaned in even more. The consequence of it, it started off small, and the last I heard, they literally had thousands of people doing, originally it was, it was in their cafeteria, their headquarters in Minneapolis. It obviously both expanded because of interest as well as because of COVID onto you know, a remote platform. But the last I heard, they literally have thousands of people, and they've trained literally hundreds of their employees to facilitate these roundtable conversations. And it obviously has grown like that, and they've, and they've continued this, because it's, it's resonating and it's striking a chord with people, and they appreciate the ability to have these conversations and kind of listen and learn. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a great example. Uh, Allstate, anybody here from Allstate? Nice Chicago company, anybody, really? I see some smiles, that's a good sign. Huh? The customers, perhaps, they're smiling. In any, Stacy Sharp is the uh, head of comms at Allstate, amazing woman, amazing uh, company. And uh, they have a great program called the Better Arguments Project that they do with the Aspen Institute. They, it's actually housed at the, Has at the Aspen Institute. Allstate's one of the big sponsors of it. And they go into various communities and kind of teach people how to have better arguments, how to have better discussions. I'll give you an example, which I think, you know, it's, they, they have several rules or principles of engagement. But I think the first one is just a really, really great reminder, and it's take winning off the table, right? So, you know, you may, just to use a political reference, just because it makes it easy to be binary in this, you know, you may feel strongly about uh, supporting a Democratic uh, candidate or you may feel strong about supporting a Republican candidate. The research suggests you're probably not going to be talked out of that too easily. Right? So if you're going to talk to somebody who is, let's say, voting for somebody who you don't like, okay, you have two choices. You can try to talk them out of it and tell them why they're basically wrong. The odds of that being successful are really slim. Right? They're really slim. But the problem is sometimes we can't help ourselves. But, right? Or you can view it as an opportunity to really listen and try to figure out why, why does this person support this candidate. If you're not going to convert them anyway, you may as well at least selfishly get some benefit out of it. Mm -hmm. So these kind of principles of engagement, I mean, it kind of sounds obvious, but you know, it's, it's really valuable. So there are companies, General Mills and Allstate are two examples, that are doing things to try to make a difference. Mm -hmm. It sort of naturally begs the question, right, if you put all the ingredients in place essentially to empower your employee set to have the tools and skills required, mm -hmm. have the safe space and programs required to be able to talk about some of these things, to learn this sort of civil discourse, if you will, as a, as a modern, as a piece of their modern toolkit, right? Um, then you, in some respects, also increase the spotlight on the company and when the company chooses or chooses not to engage or respond right. um, on some of these issues, right? I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, perhaps recently the Disney example in Florida where the company took a stand on a law, the employee base disagreed with that, actively made that point clear, 
and that sort of sent a series of snowballs rolling down the mountain, right? We yeah. saw how that all turned out. How, as you've been meeting with CEOs and, and heads of communication, what's coming up? What are you discussing about how do you make those decisions about when to engage and, and when not to engage? Presuming you'll do so civilly, right? There's still yeah. that sort of choice yeah. you have to so make as a company. So, yeah, I mean, this is like the big issue is do we engage? How do we engage? When do we engage? Is that right? So there are, there, are, there are two aspects of this I just want to talk a little bit about. One is the economy and two is frameworks, right? So just start with the economy. This is not some sort of external issue that uh, I think not just companies, but like every, every one of us can afford to ignore. Uh, I think for the most part, all the research would suggest that everybody generally agrees that polarization in this country, much less the world, is a big freaking problem. I mean, it's resulting in us, I mean, it results in everything from a dysfunctional uh, government to problems at the Thanksgiving dinner table because you can't have a conversation about something without you know, offending you know, your uncle or your grandpa, whatever. It's a big problem, right? The consequence of this is a lack of productivity and kind of making progress in a whole bunch of things. So now if you kind of think more specifically right now in terms of the economy and what's happening. So, I don't know if any of you, if you listen to the Peer Week podcast, that should be number one on your playlist. Number two, or at least somewhere in your top five, uh, should be Leadership Next, which is Alan Murray's podcast. Alan is the president of Fortune Media. I'm a big fan of his. He's the world's biggest advocate of stakeholder capitalism and, and so forth. And he has a daily newsletter that I encourage you to read, too. But in any case, he has a podcast every week, Leadership Next, interviews a bunch of CEOs and other business leaders. And he did one a few weeks ago, which I'd encourage you to listen to, with Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio is the founder of Bridgewater, the world's most successful hedge fund. This guy, besides being incredibly rich, is unbelievably smart. And it's uh, really worth listening to. In any case, he was talking about some of the really, really big drivers of where this world is going based on the study of history for the last, like, 500 years. And uh, the economic challenges we're having right now with inflation and kind of where this is all headed, energy, what's likely to happen, particularly in Europe with energy prices and what that means to the population this winter vis-a-vis -vis Russia, what's happening. Yeah, just the kind of geopolitical climate is really, really uh, kind of scary right now and not, not great. In that environment, I mean, if we, need, if we needed a, a productive government, you know, last year, we need it more so this year. We need, we need legislators and people in government who can kind of deal with the, these big, big issues. And uh, this, this polarization is kind of making it really, really difficult for them to do that. So it's a big problem. We all need to deal with it. It's not a society issue. It's a business issue. And it's going to be impacting your businesses big time. It already has. It will continue to impact your business in a big way over the next few years. So we all kind of collectively, you know, it's the old quote, I've seen the enemy and it's us. OK, it, it's us. We've got to do something about it, right? You should go home and figure out what can I do to at least talk to somebody and try to create some sort of bridge building. This is not just this feel good generic crap. This is like really, really critical to the future of how we kind of live, right? The second thing I want to just mention was framework. So you know, you ask, how do you decide on, do I engage on all of these issues? Because if I'm the CEO or the CCO for that matter, I'm getting pushed to take a stand on, you know, fill in the blank, right? So, the, this dialogue project work that we've done at Duke, we've done a number of things. So you, you can go to the, the website, dialogueproject.duke.edu. Uh, we did a thing on exactly this called the calculus of engagement. So we had some people there from like Southwest Airlines, I think Allstate. Uh, Paul Argenti, who's a professor up at the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth, presented some of his research. Uh, I moderated. It's kind of something like this at uh, Duke's Alumni Weekend, and we had the vice chairman of MasterCard and uh, some big shot from Deloitte. And we kind of talked. I mean, this is the big thing. Everyone wants to know. Basically, my CEO doesn't really want to talk about too much, but how do we? What's the calculus? Uh, there's obviously no simple answer. There's no one answer for every company, uh, but inevitably it comes down to values. You know what? Uh, what values do you have as a company? Most most of you have gone through this. I'm going to actually. Pull up my uh, 
something, oh yeah, there were three things that Paul mentioned that I think are good. I'll actually give you a little bit of context, maybe the third one. So he said the answer to this is one, does, does the, if you're trying to fi figure out, okay, I'm being asked to talk about gun violence or safety, I'm being asked to talk about immigration, being asked to talk about, pick the legislature, look at Disney, right? Okay, does the issue align with your company's strategy, which is basically you're saying, is it relevant to your business? The second is, can you meaningfully influence the issue? Do you, can you do something about it? All right. And the third is, will your constituencies agree with speaking out? That third one I'm not so crazy about, because you know, if you pick a controversial issue, the answer is, yes, yeah, some will, some won't. So now what do I do? Right? So that gets back to values. I think Disney's problem, and this is just my own two cents for what it's worth, I think Disney's problem was they really weren't being honest with themselves, and they were trying to have it both ways. So, I mean, I, I kind of read a lot about this, but not, I'm no expert on it, but I'm pretty sure what initially happened was there was a, uh, an effort by some organization to get corporations to uh, protest the legislation that was going on in Florida. And I think north of 200 companies signed that, and large, very well-known companies signed it. So they were one of 200 companies. Disney chose not to sign it, in part because Disney had, a, I think, a kind of a philosophy that they're better off not putting their name out there too much with almost anything that's at all controversial. They're better off working behind the scenes. But, you know, they were conspicuous by their absence, right? So it's kind of like, you know, very often you'll tell your internal clients, uh, I mean, I used to say this all the time, if no comment is a very loud comment, right? There's no such thing as no comment. Right? Well, you don't have to sign it, but you're, you're making a very proactive uh, decision when you choose to do that. So then Disney started, you know, they started going after Disney. They said, well, what's the deal? And they said, well, we want to work behind the scenes. And then to your point before, employee activism, which drives you know, a lot of these issues, the employees got pissed off. They said, what are you, you know, this, is, you know, this is a human rights issue. Where, the, where are we? What are, you, what are you doing? So then they had to do it because I mean, they knew it was the right thing from the get-go, but they were trying to kind of walk both sides of the street. So then they kind of were almost singularly out there protesting the legislation, and then, you know, you've got DeSantis and everybody kind of politicizing it even more, and the whole thing kind of blew up on them. And I think if you're not true to your values and kind of behave that way from the get-go, that's when you get screwed. And, you know, I think people, I mean, you think about even just in relationships, you know, you may talk to people who may have a different point of view than you on something, but if, but if it's kind of grounded in, I don't know, values and their own, you know, facts, whatever, you, you can respect it even if you don't like it, you know? But what really kind of gets you annoyed is when people, you know, have perspectives on something and, and it, it kind of bothers you, but it, it's, you know, they'll flip-flop in a heartbeat on an issue that might be important to you. It's kind of like, you know, just believe in something for God's sakes. And I think that's kind of where Disney got dot screwed. So just to bring it back to, you know, the point about how and when do you talk about these things, make sure you understand your corporate values and your purpose. I mean, this is what this whole conference is about. And that, that more than anything, should drive the behavior of the leadership. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. And, and perhaps I'd be remiss if I didn't <clears throat> also kind of make a bit of a call out for knowing your stakeholders and what they really think, right? Yeah. You know, there's a fair bit of psychological research about the closer something is to something you care a lot about, the more likely you are to make assumptions that are, in, that are erroneous. And so, you know, the, the idea that, that you would presume that some audience would agree with or disagree with, you know, there's a reason we have access to research and data, and we should avail right. ourselves of that, because often when you care a lot, a, a lot about something, you're more likely to be wrong in what you assume others will but you take know, But you know what's so hard? You know what's so, the, the, uh, what's analogous to that is if you're, you know, if you're a Democrat, you should be watching Fox News occasionally. And if you're a Republican, you should be watching MSNBC occasionally, right? Not to be converted, but just to, con right, to get... Uh, I find that really hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? I mean, I know I'm supposed to do it, I find it hard, and I think most people find it hard. Mm -hmm. But we do need to find ways to kind of do that to get a better understanding. Otherwise, we're just tribal. So, you know, Fox and MSNBC is the equivalent of your data and analytics research. You, you've got to do it, mm -hmm. but it's hard. And maybe the first step is acknowledging it's hard to do. Yeah, yeah that it will require some perhaps difficult, uncomfortable analysis, right, that you may not want to do. 
which maybe takes us to a very good closing question, which is all these good people are going to go back to their companies at the end of the conference. Yeah. And if they were to take one thing or a couple of actions away from all the research um, that the Dialogue Project has done that they can try tomorrow to make a difference at their companies, what would you advise? I mean, you know, I'll give you one and a half things. The, the one, which I kind of hinted at before, is this DE&I training. If you're already doing a lot of DE&I training, whoever's doing it, try to encourage them to, you know, incorporate its relevance outside the company. That's not some cardinal sin. It doesn't create a lot of risk. But we need, it, 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 it can't only be about how do we craft messaging for our customers so that, we're sh so that we're seen as more sensitive to diverse points of view. I mean, yeah, that's good. But I mean, come on. I mean, there, there, there are bigger issues than that. That's what this whole conference is about. Mm -hmm. So just kind of expand it. This training is already happening. So I would just encourage you to try to get people who are doing training inside your organizations to think a little bit uh, more broadly. So that's number one. The half thing I was going to say is work with your leadership. I mean, you know, this is not an issue like, well, do we want to tackle immigration? Do we want to tackle gun violence? This is something that just needs to be kind of in the DNA of the organization to help because it has to do with the productivity of the company in its industry, in this country, on this planet, right? We all know this is a big problem and it's not getting better. So encourage your leadership to find ways to continue to educate and inspire people to do more both inside as well as outside the office. I mean, thank you. Thank you, Bob, for this. I think the Dialogue Project and, and the work there is really remarkable. And if you haven't had a chance to check out the website and read some of the case studies, take a look at some of the research, I think you'll find it um, really quite helpful. It gets pretty granular from an advice perspective. So I, I challenge you all to go and check that out. Um, Thanks for taking a little bit of time talking about it. Congratulations Thank on you. the project. Thank you. Thank you all.